Hello members, uh, good evening. Welcome to this meeting. We are happy to have you. I'm Benjamin from Busoga Heritage Forum. Forum. Um, so Gareth Firm is a, a convener of Gareth Professionals. We are having our main offices in Jinja, and we are glad that we are having you in our CMEs that are weekly. Today's CME, we shall have Dr. Ruth uh, Namazi, and she'll be our main presenter today, and uh, Professor Sarah Chiguri will be uh, moderating the session, and they will introduce everything about that. Uh, Buso Gareth Forum um, is a uh, of Gareth Professionals, so it convenes and connects partners and stakeholders to improve Gareth and livelihood. Our vision is to see a Gareth and thriving Busoga. That's like our core values. Your our core values. Um, Our core values are transparency, accountability, teamwork, and integrity. And our methodology is our method of work stock strategies, work through health workforce capacity initiatives. We work through work streams and technical working groups. We also value and work through partnerships and networking. So we, we invite you as a partner, you can join us as BHF. We can find a way that you can work together and improve um, uh, the heritage in the region. We are a membership organization and we request that every person who is on this call become a member. You can subscribe to us and you support our activities to continue going on, such as the CME that we are attending now. If you want to subscribe to us, our membership uh, annual subscription for individuals is 100,000 uh, shillings per year and 500,000 shillings for institutions. But you can also become a lifetime member of Busa Gareth Forum by paying one million sharing only. Some of our core programs that we are implementing, uh, we are working in, we have RAMNAC, which is the Productive Maternal Newborn Child and Adolescent Health. We have interventions on malaria, HIV and TB, nutrition, our child, our child develop, and our child development, Regional planning and data use, we can't leave that because it is it, we, we, we want to implement through science, so we have to look at data. Then the communicable diseases, we have pro bono initiatives that are supporting people to early screen the NCDs and they can manage them. We have uh, pro programs in urban health, such as the Urban Thrive Project, which we are implementing in Niganga and Jinja City. You can contact us through our website and all the presentations like which we are going to have today can be downloaded from our website and you can follow our twitter such that you continue having updates about such cmes youtube and we are with, on our youtube we shall have all the recordings so if you miss a point in a session you can go to our youtube channel and you can find the uh the, the same either way it was or you can send us an email on the email below this same is a sponsored and powered by Maisha Med. So we thank Maisha Med for supporting us and always endeavoring that this year is happening. Thank you very much. I want to invite um, Professor to take over from here. Thank you so much. Okay. Hello. Hello. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, doctor. Okay. Yes, we can hear you. It's one means after eight PM. And I request that we start the, the session for this evening. Uh, good, ev good evening, everyone. There's some background noise. I hope someone is able to help us. 
uh, you're welcome to this session this evening about uh, organized by the Busoga Health Forum as we've had. And uh, I'll be the chairperson for the session this evening. I'm called uh, Professor Sarah Chiguli from Makere University. And I'm happy to be here because I'm actually, I could be associated with, with the objectives of this forum. Uh, we have an agenda and we'll start with an opening prayer. Uh, can I request a volunteer to lead us in an opening prayer? Okay, let's uh, pray. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us opportunity to learn more about uh, helping our communities and uh, making us better healthcare professionals. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Okay, thank you very much. I hope you can still hear me. Uh, the second agenda item is an introduction of the Busoga Health Forum. I'm not sure if uh, that was done, but uh, I welcome Benjamin Desmond to, to do that before I introduce the speaker this evening. Okay. Um... Thank you so much, Prof, for the invite. I have already uh, talked members through um, Soga Health Forum, so I can ask that you can invite the presenter and we start the session. Okay, thank you very much. So the presenter this evening is Dr. Ruth Namazi. Uh, Dr. Namazi is a pediatrician, a lecturer at Makere University, Department of Pediatrics and Child Health, and she is a pediatric hemato-oncologist. Uh, and she's here to talk about hydroxyurea use in sickle cell disease. And we know that hydroxyurea is one of the evidence-based interventions to improve the quality of care amongst individuals with sickle cell disease. And Dr. Namaz is going to tell us uh, about hydroxyurea and following her presentation, we shall have a question and answer session uh, discussion. It would be good if you can put your questions as she goes, she presents in the chat and then we'll have a, a lively discussion at the end of it. Uh, Dr. Ruth, you are welcome. Thank you, thank you, Professor, for the introduction, and uh, thank you, the Busoga Health Forum, for uh, the invite to talk about hydroxyurea uh, in uh, use in sickle cell disease. I am a pediatrician, so a lot of this is going to talk about children, but it also uh, will apply for adults uh, with sickle cell disease. Uh, this is the outline of the presentation. We'll briefly talk about the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease, what treatment options are there for sickle cell disease, and then we shall dive into hydroxyurea and how we use it and other uh, modalities uh, of uh, monitoring hydroxyurea, but also some of the adverse effect, effects of hydroxyurea and the questions that you might uh, come across from your patients as you use uh, hydroxyurea in a clinical setting. So, um, these are the objectives. I hope that uh, by the end of this uh, presentation, uh, uh, you will be able to understand the mechanism of action of hydroxyurea, to discuss the indications of hydroxyurea use in children and in adults as well, to initiate and monitor patients on hydroxyurea. This is very important. We hope that you will be able to uh, uh, start your patients on hydroxyurea and actually monitor them. 
and also to discuss some of the side effects of hydroxyurea and be able to educate uh, your patients about hydroxyurea. Oops, sorry. So what is sickle cell disease? I am sure many of you know what sickle cell disease is, but I am going to uh, just give a brief background. Uh, it is one of the most common inherited blood disorders uh, in the world. Uh, it is caused by uh, an abnormal hemoglobin, which is called hemoglobin S. Normal hemoglobin is hemoglobin A, and we have two uh, alleles for the hemoglobin. And so you, a normal person has hemoglobin AA. But hemoglobin S results from a point mutation in the globin gene, which uh, results as a substitution of valine for glutamic acid. Really, the details of this are not uh, important for you to know, but what happens after the mutation is you get abnormal hemoglobin S. An estimated uh, 300,000 children are born annually with the uh, 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 sickle cell disease. And important for us is that we suffer or have the highest burden in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. Almost 80% of the people with sickle cell anemia or sickle cell disease live in Africa. And therefore this disease is uh, what we would say is an African disease. It is a disease that we must find solutions to. And I'm happy that uh, it is getting a lot of awareness uh, in the recent past. In Uganda, 20,000 babies are born annually with sickle cell uh, disease, and it is estimated that over 80% die before they are at age five. These statistics are changing a bit. About the latest statistics show about 40 to 50% die, but that nonetheless, that is not a very good uh, outcome. So, um, what is the problem? Why is sickle hemoglobin a problem? So in areas of the oxygenation, when, uh, when oxygen levels go down, the hemoglobin molecule polymerizes and uh, causes, uh, it sickles and becomes rigid and adhesive. So it causes obstruction in the small vessels uh, of the body. And really this progressively leads to tissue in, uh, ischemia and tissue damage. And that is how sickle cell disease uh, causes uh, progressive damage to all uh, organs of the body, because all organs of the body are supplied by blood vessels. So when there's progressive and recurrent vessel uh, occlusion, progressive organ damage uh, 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 occurs. And uh, end organ damage is actually one of the leading causes of uh, mortality, even in adult sickle cell disease, because of this uh, ongoing vessel occlusion. But the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease is not as simple as just a simple uh, vessel occlusion. The sickle red cell undergoes a lot of changes and interacts with other cells like the white blood cells and the reticulocytes, causing um, a lot of damage to the uh, endothelium, but also causing a lot of uh, bodily reactions, for example, causing increased uh, secretion of white blood cells and reticulocytes, causing viscosity, causing increased uh, uh, markers of inflammation, and all these work together to cause pathology and in organ damage. And so sickle cell disease affects all organs of the body because it's not only just the red cell, but all the, the cells and also the vascular endothelium that is uh, affected. And that is why uh, you have uh, pain in the bones, you have brain damage uh, with regard to stroke, you have kidney problems, you have cardiac problems because it's not only the red cell that's affected, but also other red cells, but as well as uh, the blood vessels. And so with that, then how do we care for children and adults with sickle cell disease? How do we mitigate uh, the, the pathology that sickle cell disease occurs? So the levels of care, I, I look at them in four tier. The first is you don't really drink anything to uh, the disease. You are trying to keep the person healthy by educating them, by protecting them against infections which are common, immunizing them against infection and also uh, screening them for chronic complications. We had that talk about chronic complications earlier, I think last year. Then the second tier is uh, you treat the acute complications, you treat the painful crisis, you treat the anemia, you treat the acute stroke, okay? And then the third tier is you try to modify the disease. These are not curative uh, therapies, but you're trying to modify uh, the effects of sickle cell. You're trying to modify the effects of the uh, sickle red cell. And we have different disease-modifying treatments. Hydroxy, we're going to talk about today is one of them. 
chronic blood transfusion in an, is another, and then other medicines that are not yet in Uganda, like ill glutamine and then voxelata. And then finally, a cure, and the only known uh, two modalities that can cure sickle cell disease are bone, are bone marrow transplant and gene therapy. These things are coming. Uh, gene therapy is, is coming, and bone marrow transplant is actually coming. It's coming, it's coming very near to us. In Tanzania, uh, uh, bone marrow transplant is actually happening for sickle cell disease. So it's good for you to be aware that you, you can actually cure sickle cell disease. But today we are going to talk about uh, we're not going to talk about cure. We're going to talk about disease modifying treatments, and we're going to highlight and focus on hydroxyurea. So, how does hydroxyurea work? Why are we talking about hydroxyurea? What evidence do we have that hydroxyurea actually works? Hydroxyurea has been in use for a very long time. It was first uh, synthesized in 1869, and it was first used for the treatment of cancer. Hydroxyurea is an anti cancer drug uh, that is used to. Uh, to cause, uh, uh, to kill anti-cancer uh, cells. It was first used for a cancer in 1928. It was first tested in mice uh, in uh, 18, uh, 1984. And uh, as a proof of concept uh, happened in about 1984 and it was first approved for use in 1998 in the USA in adults after clinical trial showed that it was safe, but was also effective. So how does hydroxyurea work? Like I said, it's an anti-cancer drug. It works by inhibiting in, in inhibition of DNA synthesis, okay, and therefore causes intermittent suppression of erythroid progenitors. So it switches off production uh, of of cells, and therefore causes a reduction in the cell and the cells in the white cell count. Also causes switches the production of uh, of red cells from producing uh, sickle hemoglobin, and in ways that are yet to be understood, causes the body to actually the body marrow to actually produce hemoglobin F which does not sickle, and that is a very good benefit of uh, hydroxyurea. The good thing about hydroxyurea is that this inhibition is not uh, permanent. Once a drug is withheld, mm -hmm. everything goes back to normal. It does not, it does not, um, it does not cause uh, bone marrow suppression or long-term long bone suppression. It does not cause a plastic anemia because this inhibition is actually reversible. And also, there's no resistance or tolerance that have been described uh, to hydroxyurea. So that's a good thing about using hydroxyurea. How does it work? What's the benefit of hydroxyurea? Because of, the, of switching off uh, the production of hemoglobin ACE, it has multiple benefits to the patient. It causes a decreased polymerization, therefore improves the, the red shape, uh, or the red cell shape. That, that means that cells can actually move uh, much better in uh, the blood causes less, less vasoconstriction, uh, so reduces on painful crisis. It reduces uh, hemolysis because the cell is much uh, better and can move better. It decreases neutrophil count, therefore reduces on the blood viscosity. It increases hemoglobin uh, synthesis, so improves your uh, levels of, 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 uh, uh, of uh, hemoglobin, and that means you need less blood, you're, you're much, much better. It decreases endothelial activation, like I said, it, uh, red cells interact with the endothelium and causes uh, activation and, and adhesion and then causes vasculopathy. So hydroxyurea actually reduces all these effects. And that is why it's what we call, at least in the sickle cell world, an, a wonder drug, because it seems to be affecting almost all uh, uh, aspects of sickle cell disease uh, pathophysiology. And therefore, giving hydroxyurea gives you a lot of benefits uh, to the patient. So like I said, clinically, what do you see when you start using hydroxyurea? It reduces pain by almost 50%. It reduces the need for blood transfusion. So your patients don't need to be in hospital for blood transfusion. It decreases uh, the velocities in the, in, in the brain. So reduces the risk of stroke and also reduces the, the risk of secondary stroke in children uh, who have had a, a stroke. It reduces the, the rates of blood uh, chest syndrome, reduces the risk of hospitalization. And in very young infants, actually improves and preserves splenic function. So they are less risk of infection and also improves growth and development. That means if you started early, the children grow much better. Children with sickle cell disease are generally shorter and have delayed puberty compared to their contemporaries without sickle cell disease. So when given early, this actually improves growth and development. And therefore, the children actually feel much better when they grow up. So what has been happening? Uh, over the last uh, year, years uh, of, in regard to research and what gives us the confidence. Like I said, the first trial 
our proof of principle happened in 1984, okay, where it has actually shown that uh, hydroxyl can actually have an effect on uh, sickle cell disease. The first uh, big trial was done in 1995. It's called the MSH trial that proved that hydroxyl is effective. It was done in adults, and hydroxyl was shown to improve or uh, reduce uh, pain crisis by more than 50%. After that, trials were started in children, younger children, as young as nine months, and actually showed the same benefit, reduction in pain, improvement of the spleen function, improvement of the hemoglobin levels. And over time, many uh, trials have, have been done on the effect of hydroxyurea or on uh, uh, velocities on blood transfusion, on organ damage and everything. But until 2015, so until 2015, when trials actually started to occur, in Africa, and yet Africa had the highest burden of sickle cell disease. So most of the prior trials were actually done in, um, in the US or in Europe, where the population uh, the sickle cell disease was low. The major problem with Africa is that um, people feared that uh, hydroxyl may interact with malaria and cause uh, a lot of uh, side effects and increase the risk of malaria. This study, I wanted to highlight just to give people confidence that hydroxia did not start yesterday. Hydroxia was used almost 25 years ago, and its effectiveness was actually shown in adults more than 25 years ago. So the evidence we have on the effects of, of hydroxia spans more than 20 years, and that is why we have the confidence in using hydroxia. But what happened, what in Africa where um, uh, sickle cell disease is highest and where uh, there's a risk of infection was hydroxyurea safe and was it, did it have the same effect? It's not until 2015 when uh, the first, some of the first trials in Africa were done in children in sickle cell anemia, and this study was actually done in Uganda, the no harm trial, which showed the safety of hydroxyurea in, in a malaria uh, endemic country. In this trial, children on hydroxyurea did not have any higher risk of malaria or infections compared to in horn or placebo. And it also showed that uh, hydroxia in African children actually had the same uh, effects. They had the same clinical benefits with regard to reduction of painful crisis, acute chest syndrome, and blood transfusion. Another big trial that was done in Africa in four African countries is the RICH trial, which also further showed that it is safe. It doesn't have any additional side effects with regard to malaria risk, but also had the same uh, effects on reduction of uh, blood transfusion, painful crisis, and need for hospitalization. So with these trials, people became very confident that we can actually use hydroxyurea and therefore called for wider use of hydroxyurea, even in children in Africa, uh, just like the West had already begun almost 25 years ago. So when do you use hydroxyurea? When do you use hydroxyurea? Ideally, all children uh, start from the age of nine should be offered hydroxyurea. But the indications when you must start hydroxyurea, if a child or adult has a painful crisis, uh, more than five in a year, if they have stroke or have a history of stroke, if you have done a, a transdoppler ultrasound scan and it's abnormal, if it's greater than 20 centimeters uh, centi per second, please start hydroxyurea. If the baseline hemoglobin is less than six grams, or if you have a history or admission of acute syndrome, initiate hydroxyurea in your patient. The contraindications, when shouldn't we give hydroxyurea in pregnancy or if uh, someone is sexually active and they're not using, willing to use contraception or if they are planning to become pregnant, please do not initiate uh, hydroxyurea. Active liver disease, and I'm saying active liver disease because sometimes in, in sickle cell disease, you'll find a derangement uh, of uh, liver enzymes and this should not really contraindicate you to start hydroxyurea, but if it's active liver disease like hepatitis, first wait for it to resolve and then initiate uh, hydroxyurea. We have seen patients who have hypersensitivity to hydroxyurea, give hydroxyurea and then their, you know, their lips swell, please don't start hydroxyurea. These are few, but they are there. And if they... Uh, as in Uganda, as a national guidelines, please offer hydroxyurea to all children over the nine months. Why nine months? Because the trials are all enrolled children nine months and above. We don't have a lot of yeah. 
I couldn't join because the meeting is full. So I want the indication that the contraindication of uh, hydroxyurea. Okay, so uh, pregnancy, do not in pregnancy with even uh, disease, and if someone has hypersensitivity to uh, hydroxyurea. But please offer hydroxyurea to all children older than nine months because it is safe and it is recommended to start as early as possible. So what do you do if you want to start hydroxyurea? Investigations and what going to do um, a, co a complete blood count with differential counts uh, that include uh, uh, cell count, uh, white blood cell, uh, total white cell count, platelet count, and if you can, erythropocyte count. Do a quantitative hemoglobin electrophoresis because it is going to help you to monitor progress. One of the things that we want to see in a hydroxyurea use is an increase in hemoglobin F. So if you can, have a quantitative uh, hemoglobin electrophoresis. And then urea and creatinine, this should be within the normal range. And then at least a liver function, and this should not be uh, more than uh, twice uh, the upper limit. So start, uh, start with hydroxyurea, do a complete physical uh, exam and a history, try to understand why you're in, uh, starting hydroxyurea and where you're starting from. Have a, have a baseline, because it's going to be important for you doing monitoring. Discuss the rationale educate the patient, let them understand some of the potential adverse effects uh, of hydroxyurea with the patient, but also our family members. Document that the family actually agrees to have regular clinic monitoring because this is important. Document a diagnosis of sickle cell disease. We have seen in some patients, uh, they are labeled sickle cell disease, but actually don't have sickle cell disease. They have another cause of their um, anemia. And then initially, uh, uh, make sure that the patient has uh, a total white cell uh, neutrophil count of more than 1,500, which is the lower limit that we aim for, a platelet count greater than 100,000, and that the ALT is less than twice the upper limit of normal, and you have uh, creatinine, which is normal uh, in the normal range. Patient education is important. You need the cooperation of the patient to be able to have uh, hydroxyurea uh, effective. It is key to emphasize that we are not trying to cure uh, sickle cell disease. We are modifying the disease. The person is going to be on a hydroxyurea for a long time to be able to get the effect. So please do not uh, promise heaven on earth that you reduce on the effects, but not necessarily cure the disease. And the person is going to be on hydroxyurea for some time. And the effectiveness of hydroxyurea is dependent on adherence for, to the dosing schedule. So if the patient is not adherent, the effects of hydroxyurea are not going to be uh, it's shown. Emphasize that if a patient uh, misses a, a dose, let them not double the dose. We've seen this a lot. Someone misses 500 uh, milligram capsule, then they want to double and use 1,000. Tell them it's just uh, let them continue with their dosing schedule, but not double the dose. But also not to share the drugs among siblings. You know, you have let's say three children who have sickle cell disease, and they're all you know sharing the same thing because they think it's the same capsule for everyone. So each child should have their drug, and they should maintain their dosing. As, as, as prescribed. So for children, we start at a, a, a dose of 20 milligrams per kilo per day. Adults, we start at a lower dose of 15 milligrams per kilo per day, simply because adults tend to have more toxicities uh, to hydroxyurea. You monitor the CBC every month for the first three months, not, for, uh, not to get any effect in the laboratory changes, but to really see that the, ch the child or, uh, or adult is adhering and you don't have any uh, side effects such as uh, hypersensitivity. Then once you've got a good dose and you're sure that your patient is uh, adherent and they are not getting, let's say, excessive vomiting, then you can actually spread out this monitoring every three to six months. We have done this in a sequel cell clinic at Malago in a very large uh, patient cohort, and it's actually safe for you to space out uh, this monitoring. We used to be very uh, careful about sequel cell disease and hydroxia, so we used to monitor a lot, but it's actually not necessary for you to monitor every month or every two weeks, as we used to do before uh, in the clinical trials. Monitor for toxicity. So monitor for, uh, and I'll explain what the toxicity is, and any laboratory response, and I'll explain what that means. So toxicities are mainly uh, in the in the neutral field count, if anything falls below 1.5, but in Africa, sometimes even falling below one is, is acceptable. If the plated count falls more than 80,000, that is a toxicity. If the, if the 
liver function, the ALT AST goes more than twice the, you know, your baseline. You might consider uh, uh, to look for other causes of that or want to consider stopping hydroxyurea. At each monitoring visit, so for the first three months or every three to six months, assess for the interim clinical events. How many painful crises does that child have? How much, uh, how much did they go to, uh, get, go to hospital? Were they hospitalized? Did they need a blood transfusion? Please monitor the clinical events because clinical response is very important. Monitor adherence, make sure that they are adhering to their dosing. Check the total white cell count, check the uh, absolute neutrophil count, if you are able to check a, a reticulocyte count, please do. And this should be reducing, okay? Because uh, the hydroxyl is being effective, it is being myelosuppressive, so this should be reducing. Where the hemoglobin level, the hemoglobin F, and the mean cell volume should actually be increasing. So these are things that you should be targeting uh, when uh, you're monitoring hydroxyurea. Reweigh the patient for children. You know, they, they change weight, they grow. So please reweigh the patient and check the dose against the weight. If a child was 10 kilograms 10 years ago, uh, uh, one year ago, please, if they're 12, please adjust the dose. Because if you don't adjust the dose according to the weight, you're going to be underdosing them. When you stop hydroxyurea, if the total uh, neutrophil count is less than 1,500, or if the hemoglobin falls to less than 6, and if you have a reticulocyte count, if it's less than 80,000, or if the platelets fall to less than 80,000, please stop hydroxyurea, that is a toxicity. Hold hydroxyurea for a week, monitor it, okay, every week until the counts go back to normal. This usually actually happens after one week. Some people take about uh, two weeks, but usually this actually happens after a week. Once the counts come back to normal, so the neutrophil count goes up to above 1,500, the count goes above 80,000, you can restart hydroxyurea, but restart at a dose which is five milligrams per kilo per day lower than when the counts recover. So if your child was at 20 milligrams per kilo per day when you withheld hydroxyurea, please restart at 15 milligrams per kilo per day, then slowly raise it over eight weeks to 20 milligrams per kilo per day. We expect a clinical response in about three to six months. So do not give hydroxyurea for one month and you expect all these uh, miraculous changes. Give it time to work. And this is something you need to explain to the parents because they get frustrated in the first three months, they're not seeing any changes, and then they don't become uh, adherent. Importantly, if you don't see any increase in hemoglobin F or the MCV, this is an indication to stop. Some people just never raise their hemoglobin F. As long as there's clinical response, the child has less painful crisis, has less need for transfusion, please continue uh, hydroxyurea. Do not discontinue therapy because of fever or hospitalization. Actually, you should continue hydroxyurea, unless it is life-threatening, you know where you'd want to stop most drugs, but don't stop just because the child is going to the hospital or they've given them a, a blood transfusion, continue hydroxyurea. So for children, we start at 20 milligrams per kilo per day. Do we go higher or do you stop it? Do you just continue at 20 milligrams per kilo per day? The studies have shown that when you escalate the dose or when you increase the dose, to what we call a maximum treated dose, it's actually better and it is superior. So in a study that was done at Malago Hospital, children were randomized to either fixed dose, so keep it at 20 milligrams per kilo per day, or escalate it, increase it as much as possible until the child gets toxicity or until the child gets maximum benefit. What is a better dose and how does it happen? So this study actually was uh, done in Malago and was published in the New England Journal of Medicine and it showed a dose escalation is actually safe, is not associated with more adverse events or more infections, and is actually superior with regard to laboratory effects. So you have higher hemoglobin levels in uh, children who are on M MTD or higher dose. You have higher fetohemoglobin, and like I said, fetohemoglobin does not sickle. So you have a higher hemoglobin, the reticulocytes reduce, and the neutrophils also reduce. Overall, you have better clinical outcomes on children who have who are on a higher dose versus those who are on a fixed dose. So when do you escalate? We have indications, okay? If a child continues to have an abnormal TCD on hydroxyurea, or if at baseline they have an abnormal, abnormal TCD, aim to escalate the dose. In children who have had stroke, 
if at a dose of 20 milligrams per kilo per day, you cannot reduce the neutrophil counts to uh, less than 6,000, please escalate. And also in children who don't have a clinical response, escalate the dose. How do you escalate? Increase the dose every six to eight weeks by five milligrams per kilo per day. So if you start today at 20 milligrams per kilo per day, in the next two months, you go to 25. In the next two months, you go to 30. Of course, as you're monitoring. If your child gets toxicity, please, reduce that dose. What target do we want? We want a, a neutrophil count of between two and 4,000 without any toxicities. So you're not getting any uh, adverse events like anemia or you're not dropping your platelet counts, okay? And what we have seen at the Mlago sickle cell clinic that our children tend to range between 25 to 32 milligrams per kilo per day safely. Some, when you go beyond 25, they keep dropping their hemoglobin levels, and then you have to keep them about 25. So this is what we are seeing, but it might be different with your patients. So whenever you dose escalate, please monitor your CBC. And if you have a reticular side count, like I said, please do it. What are the challenges in clinical practice? So the only formulations outside of uh, clinical trials is uh, you have a 250 milligram capsule and 500 milligram capsule, and you're giving it in children who are 10 milligram, who are 10 kilos or who are 15. So it's not really easy for you to uh, break the capsule or put it in, in, in fluid. So how do you even work out the dose? So we have found that we can actually uh, work out a total dose for uh, the week, and then you divide that by 500. So for example, for a child who has 15 kilos, if you're giving them a 20 milligrams per kilo per day, multiply that by 15, the child should be getting 300 milligrams every day but you don't have a 300 milligram capsule. Multiply 300 by seven, you get a total of 2,500. So that week, the child should be getting 2,500 milligrams of hydroxyurea. If you divide that by 500, you get approximately, you know, four point something. So that means a child approximately will take four capsules or 500 milligrams every week. You divide that, uh, you know, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. And we have seen this works as well as when they actually have their uh, a fixed dose of maybe 250. So do not, don't fail to start hydroxia simply because you don't have the 300 milligram capsule. Use what you have and be innovative at how you dose it. What other challenges do we have in using hydroxyurea? As our patients have started to grow, there've been an issue of uh, fertility, uh, am I going to become infertile if you start uh, me on hydroxyurea, especially among the males at puberty? Doesn't it affect my sperm count? Some studies earlier on uh, suggested a reduction in sperm count uh, with some male subfertility, and they showed, especially in mice, that uh, the number of sperms and their motility actually reduced. Although uh, current studies, two large current studies, actually did not show an effect. Yes, there was a, some reduction in sperm count but that reduction did not affect the male's ability to have children or to go on and, 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 and you know, have healthy uh, children, okay? Men who participated in the first study that I told you about, the one which was done 25 years ago, they have now become bigger and they have successfully actually had children. So that gives us the confidence that actually, even if there's a reduction in sperm count, it doesn't really affect the ability of a man to have children. What about hydroxyurea conception and pregnancy? What happens to uh, this girl now who is growing and wants to conceive? What are the pregnancy outcomes with hydroxyurea? Like I said, we don't have any studies in children less than uh, six, nine, nine months. And hydroxyurea is actually a cancer drug that potentially could have teratogenic effects on the unborn child. So in this study uh, that was done uh, in, uh, in women who are on hydroxyurea who somehow uh, conceived when they were on hydroxyurea or who continued inadvertently on hydroxyurea during pregnancy. It was found that uh, pregnancy outcomes on hydroxyurea during conception and pregnancy were actually associated with increased odds of miscarriage. Therefore, we uh, recommend for women who are pregnant or who plan to become pregnant to stop hydroxyurea for that period and use other disease-modifying uh, modalities like blood transfusion to protect them against uh, poor outcomes uh, of pregnancy. We don't have enough information to recommend hydroxyurea use in a sickle cell disease while during pregnancy. I know that when you stop hydroxyurea, uh, the outcomes that the mother gets a lot of complications, 
public works can't also uh, you know recommend it when they're not having enough data of its effects. The other thing that uh, the other question, other final question that people are going to ask you about is doesn't hydroxyurea, long-term hydroxyurea use increase cancer risk? This is a can anti-cancer drug that uh, we are using for a very long time. Uh, wouldn't it increase cancer risk? There's some data to suggest that children and adults generally sickle cell anemia may be at an increased risk of cancer. It is not solid, but there's some uh, long uh, data that uh, seems to suggest that they have a high risk of uh, cancer, for example, uh, leukemia, but uh, it's not very solid. In this systematic review that pulled almost uh, 20 studies of long-term follow-up of, of children and adults with sickle cell disease, it did not show that uh, hydroxyurea use in treating the sickle cell disease uh, was associated with a risk of secondary malignancies or any uh, myelodysplastic syndromes. So we are confident uh, that there's no uh, increased risk of cancer in patients who use hydroxyurea for a long term. Therefore, hydroxyurea is safe and efficacious in children with sickle cell disease. We are calling for the wider use uh, among children, early initiation, and even in adults with sickle cell disease. And we need a longer term, uh, term follow up studies to answer these unanswered questions and long uh, term uh, side effects. Thank you so much for your attention. And I can now take questions. Over to you, Professor Chiguri. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Namazi, for that. Uh very elaborate and educative uh, presentation. And I would like to thank all the people that are on this, uh, in this session, we've been more than 300. Uh, there are a number of questions. I'll pick a few from the chat and also allow some people to put up their hands so that they can uh, ask the questions. The first question, I'll give you a few and then you will respond. The first question is, why does initiation depend on the age of the infant and not on the weight of this infant? Uh, the second question is, hydroxyra used for life? Uh, when does it, can it be stopped? Uh, you've answered elaboratively. Uh, the question about its use during pregnancy and also uh, would it affect the male reproductive system? I think uh, your presentation touched those. Uh, the others uh, were asking the long-term abnormalities. So I would ask you to answer the two questions and then uh, we shall get more questions from the from the audience. Why do you use age and not wait to start? And also, is it used for life? And if you don't have uh, the lab, can you use CBC alone uh, to start hydroxyurea? Okay, thank you. So the age is actually, uh, the studies that were done in Africa, children who are less than five kilos were not started on hydroxyurea. We're saying nine months because that is the age where the study started. We don't have any safety data below nine months. If a child is nine months and they're not uh, uh, five kilograms and above, I wouldn't really start hydroxyurea. The age is what is safe, what we know to be safe uh, in hydroxyurea. So we use uh, age because it's what is informed by the studies. Is hydroxyurea for life? For now, yes, that is what we know. I know that in future, more other uh, that other drugs are going to come up and they're coming up you give it until for as long as you have clinical and laboratory response we have stopped hydroxyurea for some people for example we have uh, certain children that just don't respond to hydroxyurea so you can stop if there's no response but for now we use uh, uh, it for life um i think i've touched about on the uh, fertility issue I've also talked okay. about uh, pregnancy. Please stop uh, hydroxyurea if someone. In okay. Uh, we'll get questions from Ayena, then followed by Owuma Robert and Katongole Benedict in that order. 
and then Dr. Ruth will answer, and then Rebecca. So, Ayena. Hello. Okay, Oma. Uh, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ruth. Uh, your presentation has really been so much elaborate and is really so make wonderful. it short so that more people can ask and one question. Yes. Uh, Professor, my question is only one. I would love to know what is now our current level of enrollment of hydroxyurea in the country? If maybe okay. now like the regional referral can begin doing that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Katongoli Benedict. Yes, thank you so much, Professor Sarah. Thank you, um, the presenter, Dr. Ruth. Um, <clears throat> um, I would want to know um, whether hydroxyurea is one of the essential drugs for, um, according to Ministry of Health, and apart from Lago, which other health facilities uh, can we find it freely available for our children? Okay, and thank you. Rebecca? Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I was asking about why it's contraindicated in uh, in acute liver disease. Is it because of erythropoiesis? Why? Okay, Isaac. Um, thank you, uh, thank you, Doctor Ruth. Uh, Doctor Ruth, my question is about the optimal dose. Um, how do you arrive to the optimal dose? How do you determine that this is the optimal dose, and how often would you monitor? Uh, a patient on the optimal dose. Thank you. Okay, I think that was answered, but uh, Dr. Namazi, can you respond to those four? And then if we have time, we shall uh, respond. We shall have more people asking okay, questions. Thank you. thank you very much. Which other uh, regional referral hospitals have? So the Ministry of Health has really worked hard to uh, avail hydroxyurea. I know currently it's available at most regional referral hospitals in Mbale, in Lira, in Atutu, in Nakaseke. Okay, so it's not only Molango, which actually has a free hydroxyurea. So that is very good. I think people are more confident. And with this training and webinars, I hope that you can all initiate hydroxyurea uh, to your patient. Of course, just like any other drugs uh, in this country, there are stockouts. And so one of the criteria you want to make sure is that when you start hydroxyurea, your patient might be able to, you know, to buy in case the drug runs out. Uh, what happens in acute liver disease, just like any other uh, drug, you don't really want to be giving uh, a drug uh, that during acute liver disease, it's metabolism, it's not really metabolized in the liver, but we don't want to be giving a drug uh, in, in acute liver disease. Uh, how do you write optimal dose? So in real life, you... Uh, Escalate and every five, every six to eight weeks while you're monitoring uh, to switch. Every time you increase a dose, so if you're increasing this a dose this month, you do a, you make you monitor a CBC until you reach a dose less of twenty five or thirty five milligrams, and you don't have any toxicity. So you're not dropping your hemoglobin, you're not dropping your uh, platelets. So you do it every six to eight weeks, increasing the dose. But every time you increase the dose, please monitor more frequently. So you monitor the CBC every month until you're sure you don't actually have any toxicity. Once you find that the child is uh, on a stable dose, we have noticed and we have the experience in the sickle cell clinic that you actually can space it out three to six months. And actually now we are trying to do that some studies, some studies to see if we can actually monitor every six months. So once you reach an empty stable dose, you can actually space it out to three to six months even up to six months without any challenges. So is it on the essential drug list for the country? Yes, yes it is on the essential drug list. The WHO uh, uh, tasked all countries in Sub-Saharan Africa to put hydroxy on the essential drug list. It is, it is supplied through NMS, uh, just okay. like any other drug, yes. The challenge is the, uh, the fact that it may not constantly be available. Okay. Okay, so Nachimbukwe, and then Sharif, and Moses Namakwa in that order. Thank you so Please much. Please make thank that question so short and make it one. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, my question is, 
For the sickle cells, are there different traits in different regions? And would the treatment vary for the hydroxyurea? Okay. Uh, then Shalif. Uh, Moses Namakwa. Yeah, thank you very much. Can a, a clinician initiate a patient on hydroxyurea with basing on CBC results only? Because in some satellite centers, there are no chemistry results like LFTs and RFTs. What is Professor's take? Thank you. Okay, so Godwin Kule. Uh, My, yes, mine is almost the same question. I was also inquiring if a clinician can start the patient on hydroxyurea, depending on their results of either LFTs and uh, CBC. Okay, for you, you're adding LFTs. So Joshua Nabasumba, Nabusamba, sorry. The hands Thank are you. becoming. <laughs> Thank yes. you so much. Uh, I think uh, uh, my question is just concerned with uh, because we are much interested in the liver functioning. Do we have any issue concerned with the renal functioning or we just based on the liver only? Okay, then Kemigisha Goretti. Thank you. My question is when you say hydroxyurea, uh, is there a point at which you can look at a patient who you think now has stabilized? and you want to stop and when you stop does the patient deteriorate and go back to to start having frequent frequent um, transfusions and so on thank you okay uh adonis yes yeah, thank you professor my question is i have a brother who is a sickler now 26 years old and uh, whenever he swallows uh, hydroxyurea, gets this itching sort of hypersensitivity. And then also, when he gets any kind of a wound, it doesn't easily heal. So is it just still related to hydroxyurea? And then how should I really manage him out? Okay, uh, maybe he needs to see the specialists, uh, but Dr. Ruth will give us the answer. Eva. And I think you are the last. Oh, thank you. Um, my question is, how often should the LFTs and RFTs be done during administration? Okay, that question, she has talked about it, but she will re-emphasize. Then Francis. Uh, thank you, doctor. Uh, I had a patient 23 years uh, presented with the signs of uh, was occlusive crisis when I tried it to ask about to <clears throat> test about to sickle cell, I didn't get uh, any information uh, like evidence. And when I asked about to hydrox hydroxyurea use, the patient said that she doesn't know about it, but she was on on fancida and uh, and. Uh, folic acid. So uh, I transfused the her, she had an HB of 3.1. The question? The question is now, can I do HB electrophoresis after transfusing her? Okay, Thank so you, you need to go to, uh, Dr. Ruth will answer, but you know, let's not label patients before we confirm uh, that they have sickle cell anemia. So Dr. Namazi, can you quickly respond to those? Thank I know you. that I was reaching the time. Thank you very much. So I want to first say that we don't call them sicklers. The patient with sickle cell disease, sickler is very stereotyping. Uh, people like us. So please don't refer them to sick as sicklers. Then to uh, can you stop? When we stop, uh, sometimes we've seen patients who um, on hydroxia, they stabilize, their hemoglobins go up to 10, and you know they're doing very well. But once they actually revert, okay, so you don't stop for now. Once it is working, it is working until you get something else. So don't stop. Uh, how often should we monitor the LFTs and the RFTs annually? We have seen that we don't have, there's a lot, there's not a lot of toxicity from uh, 
hydroxyurea from uh, uh, for, with regard to the liver and the renal function. So just an annual test is 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 okay. Can you start without uh, renal and liver function? We have done that many times also as in Mlago, we don't have liver and, and renal function tests. We can start, uh, but at least make sure that you have once, once at least once in a year that you can actually do uh, that liver and renal function to just be sure that uh, everything is fine. So you can start with your uh, with a CBC, especially if your child does not have any, if your child does not have uh if they, there's no clinical uh, sign of liver toxicity or renal toxicity, you can actually uh, uh, hydroxyurea with a complete blood count. Um, about the patient who has hypersensitivity, don't start. That is one of the contraindications. There are other things that we can give that patient and you can bring that patient to Mulago. Uh, there's an adult patient, a clinic in Mulago hospital, but you can also bring them to the sickle cell clinic in Mulago. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Ruth Namazi for that presentation. Thank you everyone for your participation. Uh, I believe that there are many more questions and uh, from the Sickle Cell Pan African Consortium, well, which I'm involved in, we are actually, we can come and give more talks, especially the standards of care and a lot of things can be shared with this team so that we go through the management of patients with sickle cell disease using the evidence that is available. I will now request uh, one of the directors for Soka Health Forum, Professor Pauline Biachka, to give a summary and closing remarks. Professor Biachka. Wow. Thank you, Professor Chiguli, for requesting me to give, I believe, a vote of thanks. Dr. Ruth Namazi, you've done a wonderful job. The presentation has been very, very enlightening, but it was also very interesting. You kept a very interesting tone that kept us all awake and attentive. It was full of content, and I believe Every member online has benefited in one way or the other. And I believe that we are going to improve our care for patients with uh, sickle cell disease. Thank you very much, Dr. Ruth Namazi. Professor Chiguli, thank you very much, our teacher. We always um, get excited when you come on to present. You inspire many of us and you have kept the flag high. Thank you very much for the moderation that you have done this um, evening. Sickle cell disease is still a problem as Ruth has um, taught us again. And in Africa, she has told us it is a big burden. And we all have a part to play in speaking to the communities, especially to test before getting married. When you have that nice uh, fiance or fiance, please go and check or even before you propose, go and check because you may break hearts if you, if you check after the proposal. But even when you deliver babies, let's tell the communities it's important. If they start to see the signs, it's important for people to test and get to know so that you can take them to the right hands, the right pediatricians to care for them. Thank you everyone for attending the meeting this evening. <laughs> and on behalf of Busoga Health Foundation, Doctor, Thank you so much day. and wish you all a good night. Okay, thank thank you. you. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night.